Welcome to the Women Who Change the World podcast, the place where everyday women world changers share their stories to inspire, challenge, and equip you to change your world. And here we have part two of this wonderful interview. It had so many amazing things that to cut any out would be sad. There will be a bit of overlay from the previous episode, but that's to keep the conversation having flow and continuity. And with that, we are back. They are focused on activities where veterans and military retirees do things together, but it's not in an alcohol-fueled situation. So they're helping them find other coping mechanisms. Yes. Instead of coping with it with alcohol. That was the answer. I had listened to a book talking about the Korean War because of my grandfather being in it. And it was interesting the that as the soldiers came home, the um the previous soldiers, the soldiers from World War II were there for them mm -hmm. when they showed up. Right. Because there's a whole there's a whole debriefing process. You don't just come back and be thrown into your family, right? Right. In my naivety, I thought it was just, oh, tell us everything you learned over there and that's the end of it. But there's more to a debriefing process, at least I hope, in that. And I thought it was kind of like what you're doing, but apparently it's not that either. Because you said it was just here, here's here's how to wear a suit, how, here's how to write a resume, here's how to do a whole thing with LinkedIn. And those are important but they have to come back and be normal people with a wife and kids, or even if they don't have that yet, how to be a normal person and not be somebody who's constantly on guard. Right. Um, and that has to, I mean, there, there's see, the trauma. You have to understand that there's no return on investment for the United States government for them to do that. Because see, as much as we don't like to think about it, money drives everything. And the reason why transition programs exist for the Department of Defense is because in the civilian workforce, every paycheck that you get, there's money taken out of it that goes into the state unemployment fund. Each company puts money into the state unemployment fund. And when somebody becomes unemployed and the state unemployment fund gets tapped, that's the money sitting there. When you leave active military service, if you have retirement income, then you have that coming in. You're not eligible in general for unemployment wherever you are. But if you leave active military service without retirement income and you can't find a job in your community right away or the community where you move to, then you can file for unemployment. The problem is, is that you didn't put any money into that. The government didn't put any money into that. And so then you're using up everybody's money in the state that's already paid into it. So the states got smart and they filed, they started a process of filing with the federal government. Hey, we want this money back. We gave this veteran so much money. We want this back from you. And so that's why there are transition programs to help people get jobs so that the services don't have to pay unemployment compensation back to the states. If there wasn't the unemployment compensation, they, there wouldn't be transition programs. They wouldn't need it. It, it would be exactly what happened to me. Soldier one day, civilian the next. But you need something. Yes, you, but, you what, need something. But, but what drives everything for our government and legitimately so because of, you know, we pay taxes into it, we want to see the money go to good things is that there's no money to be made for the government in taking time out to help us reverse that mindset thing. I'm shaking. There are some things, I guess, in this world that just don't make sense to me because it's not valuing people. Being in the military, there's lots of skills that you learn. Right. There, there's lots of skills. My grandfather came home and he was a craftsman. He built bridges. That's what he did over there. He built bridges here. He worked on cars. He was a mechanic there. He's a mechanic here. So mm -hmm. he, he found 
things that he was doing before, did them well there, and then came home and did them even better. But that's not the kind of thing that we have anymore. So how do you take all of these skills, all of these mad, crazy skills that they have and create a resume that they can use and stand behind because you don't want to just write something up and they don't feel like they can stand behind it. Right. And so that's, that's what we do (laughs) in in our time in changing focus. We spend a whole day talking about people's individual purpose and their vision and starting to, for them to start to create a vision plan for moving forward. We help them figure out why their God put them on this earth to be a human being. What is it that they exist for? What is what's at their core who are they at their core and once we and and some people really are able to refine that well during their time with us and some people just get a start on it and there are some other programs that that help them refine it too and and they can come back to us too and and help Uh, but they get once they can understand that then they can understand and then through the communications and growth assessment process they understand what kind of roles they enjoy filling on a team and what kind of a company they want to go work for based on their values and the things that are important to them and the kind of job they have. And then we take all of the skills that they acquired during their time in the military and we craft that all together because that's an optional session of what, an optional part of what we do um, for our, the people that we work with um, in our family is uh, working on their resumes to help them um, to move forward and figure out what kind of a what kind of a position they're looking for because like you said some of the things that people have done in the military just don't exist in the civilian sector in other cases what people did in the military is what they did in the military because that's what the military had them do but they don't have the slightest bit of interest in doing that in the <laughs> civilian world that's uh i had taken a test when i thought about joining the navy um, my senior year in high school and apparently I was good at remembering really long numbers. And he was like, how would you like to be in a sub? And I said, no, 20,000 leagues under the sea. No, I don't want to be in a sub. Thank you. <laughs> I wanted to fly. We, um, I'm down near Louisville, Kentucky. And then we have a, two weeks before Derby, we have a, a fireworks display and an air show. Mm-hmm. And um I love that. But what started it for me was Top Gun. I know that's Air Force, but just seeing them fly, it was, it was an amazing, it was an amazing thing. Top Gun is Navy. Top Gun is Navy. I thought there's, they were Air there's, Force. There's, com- it's combination. Okay. That you'll is see, good to know. You'll see, I, I, as far as I'm, I, I, okay, you're, you're going to have to edit this out. Okay. We'll go, we'll, we'll make this so that you can edit it. Okay. So make sure that we, we don't look like fools here. It, it's the Navy. Top guns are the Navy elite, elite fighter unit. So let's go back and, <laughs> and and address that in a way that you can cut that out. And then neither one of us sound like what we sounded like. What we sounded like was someone who was educating somebody else about the military of things that I didn't really know. Yeah. Um, it, it's your life. Because it could have been mine if I would have if I would have joined the Navy. How did living overseas affect your daughters? I will tell you that it made them into beings than the young women that they know who never had that experience. When uh, we lived in Germany, from 1999 to 2002. And so they, um, my youngest was in first grade when we went and um, my oldest, um, and and so, um, and so she finished third, she was finishing, she finished third grade when we left. Uh, And so, and the oldest was in third grade, finishing sixth when she left. And they did spend a little time in the DOD school system, but we homeschooled most of the time that we were there and we traveled. When my husband traveled within Germany for a school or something like that, we went with him. Uh, We would do our schooling in the hotel room when he was 
at his training, and then we would go out and, and, and see the community. And they learned about traveling on the train. They learned about, you know, throwing a few things in a suitcase and, um, and, and jumping on an airplane and, and going to, um, to England for a week. Uh, we um, are Girl Scouts. And, and so uh, Girl Scouts in Europe is, um, is a really exciting thing because Girl Scouts can travel internationally very easily. And so when my daughter, when my oldest was in sixth grade, I entrusted her to her uh, Girl Scout leaders and they uh, took the train from, um, from Stuttgart, Germany to Paris. Uh, I think it was, I think they went to Paris. I can't remember where they went. It was either Paris or Italy that trip. Um, and so uh, we went skiing. Um, in, in different places, camping in different places. And so they became very self-confident um, about being in new places and about talking to people uh, that they didn't know. They were, in, they were in a dance school where the only other American schools, uh, children in it were the two girls that lived across the, the hall from us. And so they had uh, dance instruction from a top um, ballerina who um, was uh, Romanian by birth uh, and um, spoke no English. And she uh, would pat them on the butt and move their feet into, and move their legs and feet into the right position. And they would watch the other girls. And they learned that that's okay, that you can, that you can do that. So uh, it, it really helped to shape them who, into who they are. I can imagine, I can imagine a life of, travel my I have friends who have laughed at us because in um what was it in 17 years we moved 14 times and people were like are you military no we just move a lot <laughs> we just move a lot it's a uh, we my kids have learned to pack and and get rid of things <laughs> you you've learned to do that when you move a lot yes you had mentioned about legos and painting when you have your sessions, why do you use those? We use the Legos uh, as a tool to help people um, describe their themselves for who they are and who they're becoming. And it turns out that painting is a very good metaphor for transition. Because in order to paint, or for them, I would say that I'll start out by saying, I'll preface it by saying that most people who come through our program have never been to a paint and sit place before. They haven't done more than paint by number. And so uh, you have somebody who gives you instruction and we do this virtually. So it's really interesting. Our, our painter, our artist is in Tampa, Florida, Pino's Palette in Brandon, Florida. They are wonderful people there to us. Uh, so I have to give them a shout out. Um, and so the artist is the coach and we give them, they, they can see the painting that they are going to create. They can see that. Uh, and she talks them through uh, from start to finish. And, and when you are creating something, when you're drawing, um, creating a painting or any kind of, some kind of an art project, there's generally a messy middle, but you have to work through it to get to the end, your finished masterpiece. <laughs> and so that's what happens in military transition. You are going through a process that you haven't been through before. There are people like me and my team who are your coaches and, and who help you through the different steps of the process. We can't do the work for you, but we can give you guidance on what you need to do. For almost everybody, there's some kind of a messy middle where they don't know where they're going. They that everything that they thought they knew is upside down and in flux. And then when they finally get through to the other end, they are living the life that they had dreamed of, the picture that they had in their head. But just like the piece of art that hangs up on the wall, when they get too close to that piece of art, they can see all the mistakes they made. And when they get too close to looking at all the things that they've done in their life, they're like, I shouldn't have done that. I shouldn't have done this. I could have done this better. And so they, we teach them to step back and look and appreciate. Um, but you know, transition is something that we go through more than one time in our life. We all are going through transition, so. It's it, seasons. Yes. Seasons of life. I um, had talked about earlier on my Facebook profile talking about 
being content in whatever season you're in. And I'm in a weird season. My oldest is 23 and my youngest is four. And so if I had stopped with my first four, I would be in a season of life where I'm beginning to be an empty nester. But since I have an eight, six and four-year-old, I'm in a season of life where the four-year-old will wake up in the middle of the night because of a bad dream, climb into bed and flip around like a fish out of water. <laughs> and so people are like, why are you always tired? Yeah, you get slapped around by a four-year-old often enough at night and you're tired too. <laughs> but you had talked about painting and I had just taken a painting class last night. And when we got to the middle of it, I was like, oh, this is horrible. Why am I doing this? Why did I pay for this? It looks horrible. And then the lady instructing the class was like, okay, now we're going to do this. And I was like, oh, oh. It actually looks like a caterpillar now instead of just white blobs on my paper. Mm -hmm. And now it's starting to look like a monarch butterfly. Is it a perfect monarch butterfly? No, it's not. And when you mentioned close up, I'm looking at it close up and I can see my Beautiful. mistakes. I can see I my it. mistakes. But if I take it far away enough and look, I'm like, okay, there's some dots that are a little big here. But it's part of who the, it's part of who I am. Mm -hmm. And for them, it's part of who they are. Yes, the military formed them. They formed how they think. They form how they react. But there are still them inside of there and their right. personality. And that's part of who they were made to be and to do. So they come home. They're trying to get this all figured out. They have a mindset of, I'm military. I'm always military. I'm always going to be military. I can't think any other way. Mm -hmm. do you help them see past that to see who they are inside or do oh, they yeah. get stuck there oh no I don't we don't let them stay there that is that is that is the key to what we do on Friday is to pull out that real person to pull out that person that's been there the whole time uh, that they knew was there but that they didn't know how to see it I can't tell you um, how many times somebody has, has we, we go on Zoom where it is where we uh, do our sessions and uh, people will ask to talk to me in a breakout room. And, uh, and when people are uh, talk, they want to talk to me sometimes about, you know, everybody expects me to do this. I don't know if I really want to do it. And I'm like, don't do it. The rest of your life has nothing to do with other people's expectations. Who are you? What were you put on this earth to do? That's what you need to do. What do you mean by it? A job or um, go to somebody, college? People, yep, be, people will say, you know, so they are, they, there are some people, um, especially people of, of a higher rank are, they're sometimes expected to go after certain kinds of jobs. But not everybody wants to have that kind of job. And you shouldn't have to go after that kind of a job in the next sector of your life if you can do everything else you wanna do in your life uh, and, and find that career satisfaction doing something else that you really wanna do. Do you also help families with this transition? Yes, we encourage spouses to come through with their service member. And it, um, sometimes it doesn't work out. So we've had a spouse, a service member come through one month and then a spouse the next month or another month. We've had some spouses come through on their own uh, because they are trying to get ready so that they can <laughs> um, prep up their service member for when it's time or some service members just, you know, we can't make them come through. So, um, but the spouse recognizes the benefit of it. So yeah. And uh, we, one of the things that makes our program different from some of the other programs that are out there, because there are a variety of programs out there. And there's, I, I can't say that, that any one person should go through all the programs, or that, because it's all, each program works differently for each where each person is. Uh, and but one of the things that makes us different is that we accept uh, veterans and um, military spouses from any era with any kind of a discharge. 
I refuse to be the judge of whether somebody's dishonorable discharge means that they should be punished for the rest of their lives. Because you know, in the old days of the military, if you got a DUI, you could get kicked out of the military with a dishonorable discharge. Today, you would be sent to alcohol rehab and you could continue on with your career. Now, where else in the United States do you get a DUI and you're punished for the rest of your life? Well, I mean, and it's so, on your record, but it's not the same thing. Right. But once you've paid the penalty for that, it doesn't show up on your job applications. No, it doesn't. But if you have a dishonorable discharge, oh, maybe it does. I mean, I thought dishonorable discharge where you did things you really you shouldn't have. I'm not talking about, you know, a DUI. I'm talking about no, you in, killed in old, somebody, you the, beat, you right. raped a woman. You In the old days, in the 1970s, the 1980s, you could get, you could end up with a dishonorable discharge because of a DUI. That doesn't make any sense. Regardless of type of discharge, you can come through our program. Um, regardless of your era, we have had some people come through the program uh, that have been off active duty for 20 and 25 years, and it changed their trajectory going forward because they were able to refocus themselves. I have um, my, actually my best friend, her husband retired recently mm -hmm. from the army and his transition has been difficult because that's all, that's all he's done. It's 20 years. 20 years of doing the exact same thing. And now what it's the, um, <clears throat> and I think that works that way, that way a lot for men in general. I've done this for 20 years. Now what I'm, what am I supposed to do? And <clears throat> one of the things I learned about with retiring with my grandfathers and things like that is that men who retire and don't have anything to do, they die earlier. Go to the women. Because the they, it affects the women the same way. It affects everybody. It's one of the one of the important things I learned when I was becoming a Mary Kay sales director is that every time you are close to achieving a goal, you need to set your next one. And what happens in retirement scenarios is that if people don't have a plan for going forward, they don't have anything to go to. And that plays games in your head. What if I'm done? What if I'm washed out? What if I'm, I've done everything? There's nothing left for me to offer. I don't believe that. But that's the kind of thing that they, they come to you with, right? I haven't, I haven't had anybody come to me like that. Um, I would, I would just remind them what my, my, I would say what John Maxwell would say, and that is okay. If you really are done, it's time for you to just get in the box and we'll cover you over. <sighs> I want you to, uh, what I tell people is to think about a tree. A tree is living and growing and a plants in general are living and growing until they are dead. <clears throat> and I will give you my father as an example. My father died in 2012 um, and he, his purpose in life was to be a teacher and he was a teacher to his core. And he ended up in, in the hospital the last week of his life. And he, and he had an um, aneurysm behind his knee uh, and they did emergency surgery because they decided they needed to do the emergency surgery to try and save his foot. Um, and what, and so the day before they discovered that they could not save his foot or his life, um, he seemed to be on the uptick because this was like, there was a, a five day, six day period, I guess in there. And so he had the emergency surgery on a Sunday night. I remember it was Super Bowl Sunday. I remember flying to New Hampshire on Super Bowl Sunday. And, um, and then on Wednesday, they sent a physical therapist to his room uh, to, to try and get him going. And she wanted to get him talking. He hadn't been talking much. And his middle initial is O, or was O, stood for auto. 
And he, my dad was born in Germany. He left Germany because of Hitler. His family was Jewish. The last 15 lucid minutes of my, my father went on to live until Saturday night. Wednesday afternoon, the last 15 lucid minutes of my father's life, he taught that physical therapist about Otto von Bismarck because that's who he was named after. My mother and I looked at each other like, oh my gosh. And he, and my, he said nothing intelligible the rest of the time that he was alive. But that was because the next day, really, he started the dying process. I was living until he was dying. And that's what we all do. And so if somebody comes to me and tells me, that there is nothing wrong. I'll say, okay, let's go get the box. And if you're not ready to step in that box, then we can find something for you to do. On the butt, it's like, wake up, pay attention. And I love it because you come out of that. I mean, my, my husband's 50 and retirement, you know, is 15, 20 years down the road. And I'm already talking to him about, you need to have a plan. You need to have an exit plan. What are you going to do when you're no longer an engineer? And you know, you are, you are really, um, you are really a good wife to, to do that. Cause I will tell you the biggest thing that's wrong. I shouldn't say the biggest thing that's wrong with the United States military, a big thing that's wrong with the United States military. And I, I say this all the time to everybody. So this, if somebody hears this there, they shouldn't be surprised. I would say this to, to general Milley. I would say this to President Biden. We work with our soldiers, sailors, airmen, Marines, Coasties, Guardians, now the Space Force, their Guardians. From the very first time you join the military, <clears throat> we teach them to be prepared in case they die. We convince them that they should have a will, they should have power of attorney, they should have this, they should have that. <clears throat> because why? Because we're afraid of what's going to happen, that we want to make sure that if they leave the military in a box, that their family's taken care of. But we don't do anything to prepare them to leave the military. And live? And, go and live. <laughs> That's exactly right. <clears throat> well, not to dismiss the, the planning of what, the, the what if planning. That's, it's an important and, and that's, part. It's very, it's very valid, but it's very important from the very first time that you start your career and your life, you should be always planning ahead for that next step. And so your, your husband should be thanking you. Even if he's not giving you good answers, you are starting a process in his head that he's thinking about it. I guarantee you. It's, um, that's a mindset proletary too of, well, you know, you're coming here, you're probably going to die. So let's just figure that out right now. That, that, they, they don't even think about living. Well, they do, but, but they just, it's just easier for the military, and, you know, then they, they know their job's done, that if, if all the paperwork is done, it's much easier to take care of. So part of the debriefing isn't, so now that you're back and you're living, what are you going to do? That's not part of your debriefing? Well, because you're going to go on to another military assignment. Oh. So like and so, so, so the way the military is set up is that one year before you are due to get out, they sue in the rest of your life. Do they have the right people? I mean, military people who are still there and they're th saying there until they leave in a box are not necessarily the right people to help them transition. No, they Did contract they... that out. Hello. Look, I'm sorry. I don't, you're not, you're, I don't mean that by... Um, in any way, shape, or form, when the, the military has uh, that there is a transition program, a Department of Defense transition program that is mandated by Congress, and it is um, done, it is implemented uh, by virtue of uh, contracts that are done with civilian contractors at the lowest bidder, which should tell you everything. That's, that's why my team and I exist and all the other transition programs out there exist because we are filling the gap. And, and I will tell you that five years ago, I 
had no idea. I, I had an idea of how the gap, how big the gap was because I work every day. I see how much bigger the gap really is. And uh, and so what we um, have to do uh, is to educate our um, our legislators on um, in both on the local level, on the state level, I should mean both. Uh, that's poor grammar from coming from a homeschool mom particular, particularly. Uh, we need to educate our local, our state, our um, our federal legislators about the the importance of uh, helping uh, veterans move into the civilian sector well. The, the reason, and, and some people will ask, why should veterans get special treatment? And the reason why, because some people look at it that way, it, the reason why uh, is because number one, because they did sign that blank check uh, to us um, be, being willing to put their lives on the line. But second of all, the vast majority of them have never had a civilian job before. They don't know how to write a resume. They don't know how to go, how to do a job interview. And so people who in the civilian sector have been in the civilian sector for, for 25, 25, 30 years who have moved around maybe from a couple companies, they've done that resume writing, they've done that interviewing. But that is, for, imagine if you had just been, if you were able to get your first job out of college without having to go for a job interview and you held that job, progressed up in it, promoted, um, didn't ever have to go any job interviews, didn't have to, to write any resumes. And then all of a sudden at the age of um, 38 or so, or, or 40, your early 40s, somebody said, okay, you know, time for you to go find another job. Mm -hmm. That's exactly what we're asking our military people to do. You'd be like, what do I do? Mm -hmm. You'd be feeling like that, like that high school senior that's not going on to college or tech school <laughs> that's out there looking for a job. You'd be like, what do I do? And, and for a, a man or a woman who has a family who's dependent on them, um, to, for support, that is major stress. Well, and they, the military is some of the best team players out there. I mean, that, that's what they do. And for them to not be able to support their team, that, that's bad for them. And, that's, and, and well, they are because they are providing help on how to find a job. So they, they are supporting they just aren't helping in the mindset arena and the mindset arena can be the biggest minefield. And, and everything in the military is focused as a team. And in the civilian sector, while we are on teams, we aren't focused on the team. Unless you're in um, the emergency management sector, emergency services, you're generally not focused on a team the same on, on, as being a team player, unless you're, you know, maybe a professional athlete or something like that, or, or like I said, in, in, in um, emergency services. And so we have to teach people to, to look at the mindset of putting themselves <laughs> first and then serving on a team, as opposed to in the military, we serve on a team and put ourselves second and our families third. Wow. And then that really flips. Then you you know your home, you're serving your family, your family's first because you're now with them. You haven't been with them for who knows how long. Then you need to take care of yourself, and then you need to serve on a team. It completely flips everything that they've been doing. But I'm going to flip years. it back at you. I'm not going to flip it. I don't want you to flip it that way. I'm going to tell you what we tell our service members and spouses that come through, our cohorts that come through our program. When you fly and the flight attendant gives you a briefing, converse. yes. And so in the civilian sector, we don't teach them to, to put their family first. Put yourself first, put your family second, and then your career. Because if you can't take care of yourself, you can't take care of anyone else. That's what I teach as a, <clears throat> as a self-care coach for women is taking care of themselves first and creating that balance. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and so that makes sense. I guess I was thinking of from the perspective, I've been away from my family for so long. 
and now I need to take care of my family. But, but if you don't take care of yourself, you can't take care of your family. Yes. It doesn't matter why, whether you're male or female. <clears throat> Which is why we need programs like yours to teach them to take care of themselves. And while I, as a civilian, can come in and say, you need to take care of yourself. It's not the same thing as somebody who's been there and knows and understands the drilled in mindset. I guess you have to have to survive to do what you're doing. It, it's, it's a, it seems to me, it seems like it's a mindset that you have to think this way in order for us to survive. Is that right? Yeah, because, you know, in the way in the military, you are trained to, um, to defend our nation. Um, and so that means ultimately you are trained to go to war. Should that be the case? Hopefully that's not ever the case. And so you, we, we train people to do that. Um, but that is, I don't know whether that's, you know, I'm not sure. I understand. So how can everybody reach you? We are at leadertransitioninstitute.org and we are on Facebook, we're on LinkedIn, we're on Twitter, we're on Instagram, spread a little thin in all of the places. We're, we're, we're heavier on, uh, on LinkedIn um, and, um, and Facebook than we are on Twitter and, um, and Instagram, but we are there. Uh, and we uh, would love to serve you. We'd love to serve your family members. Uh, and uh, that's, we, we exist to serve. Our, uh, the Leader Transition Institute is a 501c3. I created that as an umbrella for changing focus, moving from we to me, because when we did our very first session back in July of 2018, people at that session told me that first responders and teachers need to go through something similar. And so that's why we created the Leader Transition Institute so that we could have a bigger umbrella to put some other programs to serve, to specialize um, for other people who need us in the future. Well, that's all I have for you guys today. Thank you so much, Annie, for your time. I appreciate it. I am so thankful for you and I respect what you're doing for stepping in and helping people have a life after giving everything that they have given. I will have links in the description so that you can get a hold of her. If you yourself are in that transition or you have someone you love that's in that transition, contact her, get the help you need to get the life that you deserve to live after doing all that you have done. There is a reason you're still here and the world needs you. Just like Annie talked about with herself after she was done switching over, there was a reason she was still here. And that reason is to serve, which is what we're all made to do. We're all made to serve in some form or fashion. Thank you for your time today. And I will talk to you guys soon. Bye.